Okay, well, good evening, everyone. My name is Maddie, and I am one of the park naturalists at Gulf Branch Nature Center, along with Ken, who many of you probably um, already know if you've attended Gulf Branch programs before. Ken's been around for a little while now. Um, I'm super excited to be able to bring this program to you virtually from the comfort of your couch. We, um, despite the building still being closed, we are providing programming in the park outdoors as well as virtually like we are doing this evening. And we're definitely um, grateful and excited to, to be able to provide this kind of programming for you. So we're glad that you are here this evening um, and as excited about Monarch Butterfly. Everybody should be able to see my screen now. I've converted my presentation into a PDF that works a little bit better with bandwidth when we're worried about, you know, not enough bandwidth for some folks. So hopefully we all can see my screen. Everybody good? Certainly speak up if you can't see it and we'll try to work through it together. So we're going to be um, talking about monarch butterflies tonight. So if you're not here for monarchs, you're in the wrong spot. We're going to begin tonight um, by talking about just butterflies in general, right? Monarchs are butterflies. They are part of the Lepidoptera family, along with all the other butterflies and moths that are out there in the world. Um, butterflies evolved from moths about 100 million years ago. So you can think of moths as butterflies, sort of ancient cousins. And butterflies, really, we can think of as day flying moths, which is why I included this happy little sunshine up here in the right corner. Um, our butterflies are our day flying moths. Like all members of the Lepidopteran family, they have four wings that are covered in scales. And that's what we're seeing over here on the left, right? This is a very zoomed in picture from under a microscope of the scales on a butterfly's wing. Um, they are insects, of course, right? Winged insects. So they have all the same insect parts that we've come to know and expect, right? They've got three body parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, six legs that are attached to that thorax, and two antenna, which for butterflies, they actually use those antenna to sort of feel the world around them. Um, this is one difference between butterflies and moths, right? Butterflies typically have these smooth, clubbed antennas and moths typically have feathery antennas, although there are always exceptions to the rule. Um, on the right here, you can see another sort of common difference between um, moths and butterflies. Right, this is a butterfly. It's got those clubbed antenna and oftentimes when butterflies are at rest, they rest with their wings folded together. Moths will typically rest with their wings apart and this is speaking in very general terms. Obviously, there are lots of times when butterflies are out and about sunbathing and catching those rays and warming up their body temperature and they're resting with their wings open. So um, again, you've got to sort of take it with a little bit of a grain of salt, right? There are always exceptions. Our butterflies as adults are nectar drinkers, so they have um, what we call a proboscis, which is what you're seeing here. This is the mouth part that works similarly to a straw to draw nectar out of flowers. So as adults, again, they are nectar drinkers. They're going to be looking for flowers to drink that nectar. Okay. So just one of the variety of butterflies that we can find in Arlington and these are just some examples of common butterflies in our area right our silver spotted skipper, eastern tiger swallowtail, eastern tailed blue, common buckeye, our monarch of course at certain times of year, red spotted purple, eastern comma, orange sulfur, great spangled fritillary, and cabbage white, which is probably the most common butterfly in our area. So I just wanted to share this to give you some sense right that monarchs certainly are popular, they get a lot of attention, but they are not the only butterflies out there and not the only butterflies that we should be thinking about and, and loving and caring, okay? Lots to explore in Virginia. Um, like many insects, monarchs go through what we call a complete metamorphosis. So throughout their life cycle, they're gonna change from egg to larva to pupa, or we often know this phase as chrysalis, um, all the way to adults. So starting over here on the left, right, a female monarch will lay eggs on the underside of milkweed leaves. Um, it sounds like lots of you already know that milkweed is what monarch caterpillars need. It is their food source, right? Monarch caterpillars um, only eat leaves from the milkweed plants so that 
um, female monarch butterfly who's laying eggs has to find milkweed plants to lay those eggs on. After about four days, um, the eggs will hatch and teeny, teeny, tiny caterpillars will emerge. The caterpillar that we're seeing in this picture is actually not as small as they are when they first come out of their eggs. When they first emerge from their eggs, they're really teeny, tiny, um, probably about the, they'd say half the width of a pinky fingernail. Um, and again, green with sort of black head. They will go through what we call various instars during their caterpillar stage. So as they're eating, right, that's all they do as caterpillars is eat and sleep and eat and sleep, just like all baby things do. Um, they're going to sort of morph through those different instars. So they're going to grow, they're going to shed that insect exoskeleton and get larger. And what we're looking at in this picture here that I'm circling with the mouse is a caterpillar that's probably in its third instar. So it's shed its exoskeleton a few times by this point. Monarchs will again go through five instars, so they will shed their exoskeleton four times, and they get to be this large. And I actually have a monarch caterpillar this evening that I found outside tonight that I'd love to share with you. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually stop sharing my screen for a minute so you can see my camera again, and I will share a monarch butterfly with you that is in its fifth instar. Can everybody see me again? Yeah, I see a nodding, yes. All right, this guy actually is fairly small. I would say it may even actually be still in its fourth instar. I'm going to try to get it sort of close to the camera so you can see it, but not so close that it's blurry. Right, so you can see when they get this large, they start to have that black, white, and yellow coloring, which um, it seems like it wouldn't be so great for camouflage, but if you've ever tried to search for a monarch butterfly caterpillar in milkweed, you know that this pattern actually makes it a little bit difficult um, to be able to see them. Okay, your little guy here. No, actually, it's the reverse. It's a warning color. So it's, yeah, it makes as, it easy. Adults, as adults, they definitely have that warning no, color. No, the caterpillar too. Yeah, I have heard as caterpillars that the, the yellow can serve as a warning color. Just speaking from personal experience, I do think that when they're on the underside of the milkweed leaf, those stripes um, can sometimes look like the veins of the underneath of a milkweed leaf. So um, I think it, you know, the stripes maybe are helping with what I would say is a little bit of camouflage. And then the bright colors are probably what we think of as the warning sign, right? Just like the bright orange on the adults. So that bright yellow is going to be a warning. And we'll talk about why in a minute. Okay. Okay. Let's go back to our presentation here. So after that fifth instar, our monarch butterfly is actually going to climb to a space where it feels sort of safe and secure, often it will be away from the milkweed plant. Um, and it will use um, uh, an organ in its head to spin what we call a spinneret. So that's this little web of silk that you see. I'm sorry, it will use its spinneret to spin the little web of silk, which is what you see here. And then it will sort of hang itself from that little web of silk using a part of its body called its cremaster. It hangs in this J shape, we say the J up, and it will shed its caterpillar exoskeleton for the last time. And what emerges is the monarch chrysalis, okay? Um, this is really what makes butterflies different from moths in a really big way, right? Our moths are gonna go through a pupal stage, but they will actually spin a cocoon to protect themselves during that pupal stage. For butterflies, there is no cocoon, right? There is no sort of silk that surrounds the chrysalis or surrounds the pupa and protects it. It's just hanging out there in the open. Um, the, the, there's a sort of cellular rearrangement that's going on from, uh, you know, the change from caterpillar to chrysalis and then from chrysalis to adult butterfly. And um, oftentimes we will hear folks talk about the chrysalis as if the caterpillar is just hanging out inside of the chrysalis. But I really want to emphasize that the caterpillar becomes the chrysalis and then the chrysalis becomes the adult butterfly. So that chrysalis, um, depending on the weather and the temperature, um, will stay in that pupil stage for about 8 to 15 days and eventually emerge as an adult monarch butterfly. And as that emergence gets closer, the exoskeleton of the chrysalis starts to become a little bit transparent, which is really what you are seeing here until it is fully transparent and then breaks open and an adult butterfly emerges. 
that adult butterfly is going to sort of hang for a little bit while its wings dry and then right launch itself into the air and begin its journey which we're going to talk about in just a minute all right so again just taking a look at our monarch life cycle a little bit um, up close right that egg as it's ready to hatch will often turn a darker color and like I described, right, that first instar is sort of a pale green with a dark head and that caterpillar is going to make its way through um, multiple changes until it's ready to transform into a chrysalis and then again into an adult monarch butterfly. OK. I would really love to share this transformation with you, so I unfortunately can't get the video to play through the PDF, but I am going to go ahead and play it um, on my screen here. Hopefully everybody is still with me while we made that switch. Transformation happened in a time lapse video. All right, everyone, so we got to see that time lapse happen. I'm going to go ahead and share the presentation again. So give me just one second to get that sorted out. If you noticed um, the uh, butterfly hatching, there was something wrong with it. The, the um, abdominal segments uh, separated. You can see the abdomen through it. It shouldn't separate. Something was wrong with that. I, I don't really know if that particular one was able to get out for, uh, well. Yeah, it's possible. I um, That video is one that I've known about for a long time, and I love that it allows us to see those changes happen in real life. I don't know how well that individual butterfly ends up doing um, in the long run, but we did, can hope for the best. Did you notice it? That, that the abdominal segment se separate? Did I notice it? No, Bernard, I did not. Um, it, it, it shouldn't. Yeah. It gets, it's, just, it's just a little bit wider, but not much. Yeah. So something was wrong there. And, and it, is it what if I would have made a hard time getting out of the actual shell itself? Yeah. Look, look at it closely, you'll see. Sure, yeah, I'll watch it again and give it a try. All right, everybody, Um, can you see my screen again? Just making sure. Can everybody see my screen? We should be yes. looking at the, the PowerPoint again. OK, great. Yes. So we got to see that monarch butterfly or caterpillar crawling around on the milkweed. Um, like Bernard mentioned earlier, monarch butterfly caterpillars um, 
Right there, host plant is milkweed, and that's because milkweed has a toxin in it that actually makes the caterpillars toxic as well. So, of course, we can touch caterpillars, no issue, but if we were a bird, we wouldn't want to eat that caterpillar. Um, and those toxins accumulate in the caterpillar's body and actually hang around even when that caterpillar transforms into an adult. And so those bright orange colors that we see on monarch butterflies are to serve as um, sort of a warning, right, that that monarch is not palatable. Um, and I would say again that those bright colors that we see on the caterpillar do the same thing. So moving right along here, um, what makes monarchs really unique in the butterfly world is this migration that they take in the leave, it's actually a multi-generational migration. There are other butterflies in the world that do migrate, um, but there aren't too many that have this really special multi-generational migration. And so when we're looking at the map here, what we're seeing is the travels that monarch butterflies take over the course of a year. So the monarch butterflies that are born here in Arlington at this time of year are the generation of monarchs that will travel south to spend the winter in Mexico. Okay, that's what we're seeing over here on the left. They come together in the Oyomel fir forests in Mexico and spend the winter there where the climate is a little bit easier on butterflies and there is a, a good water source and that's where they hang out for the winter. That generation that flies south um, in the spring in Mexico is going to lay eggs and those babies of that generation that spent the winter there will fly part of the way north from Mexico um, when they are adults, right, lay eggs, die, and then their babies will continue the journey, right? They will um, lay eggs as adults and die, and then their babies will be the ones that make their way to our area. So we've got usually about four generations of monarchs that are making that journey northwards from Mexico. So while there is just one um, generation that's making the journey south to Mexico from Arlington, there are successive generations that are making the following journey northwards in the springtime and summer. Okay, I hope that makes sense to everybody. That sort of multi-generational migration is what makes monarchs really unique um, and it really fascinating when we think about the fact that these butterflies are making this journey without ever having been to these places before, without having parents show them the way. So there's been a lot of research done to, to sort of understand how they know where to go and when to leave and how to get there. Um, what's been found is that, you know, in terms of knowing when to go, both in terms of, you know, that fall trip south and the, the spring journey north, right, changes in uh, temperature as well as day length sort of trigger this response internally in the monarchs, whether it's decreasing temperatures and day length um, when we're talking about the monarchs that are making the journey southward or increasing temperatures and day lengths when we're thinking about those monarchs who are going to make the journey northwards. For the southward journey, our monarchs also start to recognize that milkweed is sort of reaching the end of its um, lifespan in the fall and there are, are fewer nectar sources, right? Flowers sort of are reaching the end of that stage of their life cycle at this time of year and so that is also a trigger that tells them, yep, yeah, it's time, right? We're ready to make that journey south. In terms of knowing how to get there, um, some of the first research indicated that monarchs use the position of the sun to figure out how to go either in a southwesterly direction or a northeasterly direction. Um, but just knowing right, the position of the sun is not enough to, to sort of clue into exactly where they need to go. So monarchs also have an internal clock, much the way that, that people and lots of other animals do that sort of tell us, right, this is the time of day when we're feeling a little sleepy. This is the time of day when we're, when we're ready to wake up. Um, and so that internal clock sort of combined with the position of the sun, which they can see with their eyes, they're also sensitive to UV light, so they can see that UV light as well. Those two sort of sources of information combined together allow them to navigate where they need to go. Okay, knowing exactly how the monarchs get to the OML forest is still a little bit of a mystery. Remember, the monarchs that are born here in Arlington and making their way south for the winter have never made that journey before. Um, research recently has sort of narrowed down um, the sort of genetics involved, right? So a study in 2014 um, identified 536 genes in a monarch that uh, contribute to its knowledge of its migrational patterns. And 
there are genes uh, in that 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 generation that sort of makes that journey southward um, that are specific to sort of enhanced flight muscles in the monarch as well as um, a different metabolic rate. So it makes those uh, those monarchs that are migrating those long distances more like marathon runners than sprinters. Um, and so there there's some guesses out there that genetics certainly are involved in terms of monarchs knowing exactly where to go right all the way to the oil mile forest. But there's definitely still more research that is needed. Um, and when we wonder, right, how does a, a mother or a female monarch know how to find the milkweed? There is 2000 research done in 2008 that suggests that adult caterpillars or adult butterflies, excuse me, remember experiences that they had as caterpillars. So as caterpillars, right, they were born on milkweed, they ate that milkweed, they're familiar with the scent and the feel of that milkweed, and there's a good chance that as adults, despite going through this sort of cellular rearrangement in their pupil stage, they hold on to that memory of, of what that milkweed smells and feels and tastes like. And so as adult females, they know exactly where to go to lay their eggs so that those caterpillars have what they need to grow, right? They are just going to eat milkweed. If they end up on the wrong plant, they're not going to make it. Why do monarchs need our help, right? There obviously has been a lot of attention um, regarding monarchs in the last especially I'd say the last decade or so, right? And we talked a little bit about lots of the other common butterflies that you can find in Arlington. So, so why are monarchs getting all the attention? Um, monarchs really need our help because their populations have seen pretty serious declines primarily as a result of habitat loss. So since the 1990s, the overwintering population of monarchs has declined by over 70%. And that's true for the, the eastern population of monarchs that we're familiar with that make this incredible journey and the western population of monarchs out in California and Mexico that don't travel quite as far, right? There have been declines in, in both populations. Um, this chart down here at the bottom really shows us what that looks like over the last 20 plus years. Um, we can see much greater levels of monarch populations back in the mid 90s. And of course, there are seasonal changes in weather and temperature that impact populations from year to year. But unfortunately, that downward trend is what we're seeing. And this little chart comes from the Center for Biological Diversity, which is a, a nonprofit that focuses on increasing biodiversity in the world. Um, so I certainly trust their data and it's um, in line with data from lots of other sources as well. So everyone is sort of seeing this, this downward trend, right? Um, really, this downward trend can be attributed to a couple of things. The, one of the largest is a loss of breeding habitat. So monarchs need milkweed, and milkweed traditionally was found in what we call the corn belt, right? So that Midwestern part of the US that they're going to be traveling through as they make their journey northwards to our area and further north up into Canada each year. Um, and, you know, milkweed would traditionally grow along the edges of fields and in between rows of crops. And as we've sort of uh, transitioned away from more traditional forms of agriculture to agriculture that is really heavy in pesticide use, we're even using crops that are resistant to pesticides. So the whole field can be sprayed um, with pesticides and insecticides and herbicides, right, and those plants right the the crops that we're trying to grow survive and all the other plants are sort of decimated as a result um, and that includes the milkweed so right there just isn't as much milkweed out there as there used to be okay um, another contributing factor is the loss of overwintering habitat so if we take a look at the map here you can see the oil mile forests in mexico where the monarchs go are black and they're just these teeny little areas in Mexico and they're facing a lot of pressure from a number of different things. Um, one of course is um, timber harvesting in the region, right? Um, as well as subsistence agriculture. So there are folks who are farming to make a living and they are cutting down some of those trees, right? So that their families don't go hungry. Um, we also have climate change that we're concerned about. So as the climate changes, the, the range where these trees can grow is shifting further northwards into the mountains. So there is um, a lot of research being done about, you know, moving trees and planting trees further up along our mountains in Mexico so that, you know, as the temperature shifts and the climate changes, those trees have a surviving chance. 
Um, but certainly we're seeing um, declines in those forests because of increasing temperatures and the changing climate. OK, um, I would say overall as well, right, when we think about um, just meadows and fields and places where we would find wildflowers that adult monarchs need for, for nectar sources, whether they are making that journey northwards or southwards, right? We don't have nearly as much of that as we used to because we've continued to urbanize and suburbanize um, much of our environment. And so there's also a loss of those nectar sources as well, okay? Not all doom and gloom though. Right, there's lots of positive things that we can do. Um, so creating and improving habitat. Um, one of the biggest things you can do is plant milkweed for juveniles, right? The common milkweed and the swamp milkweed are gonna be your two best bets in our area. They are common milkweeds that are found growing in the wild. There are a number of um, other milkweed species that are native to our area, but they're not nearly as common and much more rare, and you're likely not to find them at a, a native plant nursery. I did include butterfly weed, Bernard, because it is listed as a, a host plant for caterpillars on a number of sites that I visited, the, the Forest Service website, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, um, Monarch Watch and Journey North, which are both Monarch websites that provide a ton of information, list butterfly weed as a, a host plant for Monarch. So your information about butterfly weed um, not being a great host plant for them is news to me. So I have to do uh, a little read, more research yeah. on my own. Read, a book, <laughs> read, you know, uh, Alonzo Avogadis? I do, yeah. Mm -hmm. he, he's written it on, on milk, but he specifically said that it's not uh, butterfly weed that lacks the toxin and therefore the monarchs oh, don't. Okay, but, great. You I will see some, uh, some caterpillars on it, but not very many. Yeah, yeah. I certainly have seen caterpillars on butterfly weed, and it is listed as a host plant at all of these sites. But I will touch base with Alonzo and see where he got that information from because I'd love well, to I've learn seen, more about myself. that. I obviously don't want to give anybody the wrong information. So I don't think planting butterfly weed can hurt. Um, right, it is a nectar source for adult butterflies, and if some butterflies are using it, that's great. But I would stick with again the common milkweed and the swamp milkweed are like your go-to. You're going to be able to find them at nurseries. You want to plant them. You know they're doing great things for the caterpillars. Um, I would say if you plant it, they will come. I will have never had an instance where I have planted milkweed and monarchs have not shown up. So as long as you get it out there, they will make their their way there and find it. We also want to make sure to plant um, a late flowering native wildflowers for those adults in the generation that are making the journey southwards. So those are the flowers that are blooming at this time of year, right? Our goldenrods, there are lots of different um, gold, native goldenrod species that you could choose from. Our asters, right? Like our, our white wood asters are a great choice. Um, the Veronia species, so our ironweeds. New York ironweed is really the most common in our area. There are a few other native iron native ironweeds, but they're they're much less common, and you're probably not likely to find them at a nursery. So New York ironweed is is the way to go. Um, and then late th flowering thoroughwort or bone set, right? Those plants in the Eupatorium species. Um, and we're seeing some of these plants here. To, so to sort of talk you through them, we've got common milk, milkweed up here on the top left. And then those orange blossoms are, of course, butterfly weed. Down below, we've got a goldenrod species and our white wood aster on the right. On the bottom, we've got our bone set, our late flowering thoroughwort or bone set. The common name sort of varies depending on who you're talking to, but you're looking for um, plants in the Eupatorium genus. Um, and then on the right, that bright purple flower is our New York ironweed, which I, I really love for its beauty and because it provides you know, nectar for those butterflies that are making that journey southwards. Um, we also want to think about planting native wildflowers that bloom throughout our growing season. So from you know March all the way through October, um, because those plants are going to provide nectar for the adults that are making their journey northwards and laying eggs for that next generation that's going to continue the journey. So really, I mean, planting natives is the best thing you can do for our monarchs, as well as lots of other insects the birds that depend on the insects and all the other creatures that are connected in this web of life, right? Planting natives is the way to go. Planting your garden in the sun, if you do 
have the ability to have a garden. Um, butterflies, right, they need that sunshine to warm up. They get their body temperatures to a, a point where they can fly around easily. So they're going to prefer flowers that are in the sunshine. That's not to say that you should not plant native flowers in the shade. Please do that. <laughs> but if you're specifically trying to attract adult butterflies to your garden, you want to have a sunny garden. Avoiding pesticides should go without saying, right, those pesticides um, are sort of indiscriminatory. They will affect everybody. So not just the pests that you maybe don't want in your house, your cockroaches and your ants, but the whole other right, wide world of, of insect life that we do like to see. So um, eliminating pesticide use if at all possible. Um, and then supporting the preservation of overwintering habitat in Mexico. So there are researchers and universities that are working, like I talked about briefly, um, to to do research on what needs to happen to make sure those forests stay around, right? Even despite climate change, right? They've been planting the OML fir trees further north in the mountains to sort of get a head start. And, and hopefully in you know 20 and 30 years, when the forests that are lower in the mountains are no longer surviving, those, those forests higher up will hopefully be thriving by that point. So there is research out there and you can, you can search around on your own to, to sort of figure out how you can contribute to that effort. And I'm happy to provide some, some more information if, if you're really curious about that. Okay, I did briefly want to talk about raising monarchs in captivity because this has been sort of a popular theme that's been suggested. I want to emphasize that this is not a successful conservation strategy. So if you're interested in helping monarchs, the best thing you can do is plant the native plants they need to survive. The milkweed for the caterpillars and then the late flowering nectaring plants for the adults. Right, raising monarchs, taking them out of the wild and bringing them into captivity is a wonderful educational opportunity. If you have kids at home that you want to get excited about butterflies and monarchs, it's a great way to do it. If you're a teacher or an educator, right, I encourage you to do it with your students, um, but do not do it as an attempt to help the monarch butterfly population increase. Right, it has not been proven to be a successful strategy for increasing monarch populations. If you are going to do it, there's tons of recent research out there that um, provides sort of best practices. So what you're looking at here is actually a test monarch. Um, this monarch was uh, bred in captivity and raised in captivity, and these researchers actually sort of tethered it gently when it emerged from its chrysalis to understand which direction it might fly. And what they discovered is that monarchs bred in captivity and raised in captivity are not able to orient south. Right? They don't do it. They don't fly south. They get all confused. And the same is true even for locally sourced monarchs that are raised indoors. OK, so if you've got monarchs in your yard and you're interested in sort of seeing that life cycle happen and you bring them inside, right, that's not a great thing to do. So if you are going to keep monarchs in captivity, a few suggestions are to collect just a few from your local area. Don't buy and release monarchs shipped from other areas. You want to give them enough room, so consider keeping monarchs in individual containers where they can't share diseases if one of them happens to be sick. And you want to make sure the container is large enough that when that butterfly emerges from the chrysalis, it has room to hang and let its wings dry. OK, its wings dry in a straight fashion so they form correctly. You want to maintain cleanliness, so rinsing your milkweed leaves that you're feeding the caterpillars, blotting them dry giving them fresh leaves daily. If you've got paper towels at the bottom of your enclosure, like I had in my jar, changing those paper towels daily and removing any caterpillar poop that accumulates, right? No, no creatures do well when they're living in their own mess. Avoiding extreme temperatures, um, so keeping them out of direct sunlight where they might get overheated and keeping them from becoming too damp. So remember changing that paper towel daily and then keeping those containers outdoors. I would say, you know, if you've got monarchs and you're excited to see that happen and they're on milkweed in your yard, the best thing you could do is just take a net and place that net right over one caterpillar, right? And leave that caterpillar outside where it's exposed to the sunlight. Um, and let it do its thing and keep an eye on it because once it right becomes a chrysalis and then it's ready to emerge, you're going to have to watch it so that you can remove that net and let it fly away as it becomes an adult. OK, so again, not a successful conservation strategy. I wouldn't encourage you to do it unless you're using just a caterpillar or two for educational purposes. OK. 
All right, some additional Monarch resources if you want to continue to learn. Journey North, Monarch Watch, and especially Monarch Joint Venture have wonderful, wonderful information about Monarch butterflies and about sort of best practices and things that you can do to help. Um, Monarch Joint Venture especially has some sort of more in-depth webinar series about the latest research that's been happening on Monarchs. So I would direct you directly there if you feel like our little talk tonight was not enough, you needed more, you needed deeper information, that's the place to go to get it. If you'd like to garden for monarchs and other native species, I'd encourage you to visit the Audubon of Northern Virginia has a great webpage, and the Virginia Native Plant Society and Maryland Native Plant Society have lists of local nurseries that provide native plants. Arlington County actually has a conservation landscape program where if you own property and you've got a yard and you want to transform some of that yard into what we call a conservation landscape, there are some things that they can provide to help. So I, I would encourage you to check that out if it's something you're interested in doing. And then finally, Long Branch Nature Center, Gulf Branch's sister nature center, will be hosting a native plant sale on October 3rd. So you do have to pre-order this year because of COVID concerns, but you can do that right online. And we have got tons of native plants in, uh, in the Parks and Recreation Nursery that we would love to share with you. So um, that's an option as well. And then finally, information on rearing monarchs in captivity for educational purposes. If we've got educators or teachers in the audience tonight, right? Those best, some of those best practices that we talked about and going into further detail about how to um, do it in a way that doesn't impact monarch populations or impact individual monarchs in a negative way, okay? So that is all for this evening. I'm gonna stop sharing.